Father, thank you for the privilege of celebrating Jesus with friends nearby and friends from far away. We're all here because of you, Lord Jesus. Without you, uh, we wouldn't even know each other for the most part. So we're grateful that you are here with us. Make your presence known. Inspire us to hear from you and do what you would have us do as we trust you and love you as you deserve. In your name, amen. Luke 3, 21 and 22. Luke 3, 21 and 22. Last week we talked about the ministry of John the Baptist, and as John was ministering, the Bible says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Baptism. It's one of the recognized and universally practiced aspects of following Christ around the world and for the past 2,000 years. Baptism is one of the most important milestones in the Christian life, biblically. Great memories connected with baptism. I remember through the years in pastoral ministry, baptismal experiences. I remember as a student, as I served a rural congregation on the weekends, I remember a couple of incidents from that ministry when, first of all, there was a gentleman, this was about 1979, there was a gentleman in the congregation who had been, uh, he was about 90 years old at the time, and he told me he remembered uh, as a young boy that the baptismal services they would have at the church, and one year they had a baptismal in the winter, and the river was frozen solid with ice. And the mill house was nearby with the big pot belly stove. And they fired up the stove and broke the ice. And he remembers dressing around that stove in the, the old mill house on the river. And I'm sure that was a baptismal experience that he wouldn't be likely to forget. I remember one year having a baptism in March. And we had a baptistry at the church. But the young lady who had made a decision for Christ, who wanted to be baptized... She said, you know, I, I really would prefer to be baptized in the river like Jesus was. And this was early March uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And it usually is f fairly, uh, you know, in the 50s or 60s, but a cold wave came through. And I kid you not, it was snowing. And so um, we went out to the creek and gathered around and... Um, gratefully, I had one of the elders uh, perform that baptism. <laughs> I, I, I encouraged them from afar <laughs> as they got down in that ice cold water and uh, were baptized. I'll never forget one of the first baptismal services in that student church when I served back again in the late 70s, early 80s. And I remember we had uh, some young men who had made a decision for Christ, they were baptismal candidates, and we didn't have a baptistry at that church building, so we borrowed one from a nearby congregation. And we were going to have the baptismal about 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, and we got there, and the pastor had evidently forgotten. And we got there, all the people arrived, and the church is locked. We couldn't get in. So I broke in the church. Uh, actually, they had left a window open in the basement. And so I found an open window, and I opened the window and crawled through into the kitchen of the church, went up and unlocked the door. We had to fill the baptistry. And I remember one of the young men, after all of that effort, one of the young men that I, that I baptized that day as we were there in the baptismal pool, and, and right before we, I immersed him, I'll never forget, he looked up at me and he said, Hold me good, I'm scared of water. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> great, great memories. Celebrating life with Christ. I remember my baptism. I remember I was 10 years old. I'd made a decision for Christ. And I remember 
that day, and it's a special memory for me. Let's talk about Jesus' baptism. Let's talk about our baptism. Let's talk about what we learn from the Bible about baptism, why Jesus was baptized, why we're baptized, and what God wants to teach us in our baptism. First of all, let's deal with what is unquestionably the most, sadly, the most controversial aspect of baptism. How do we administer baptism? Let me talk about how we in our congregation administer baptism and why we administer it in that way. So let's talk about baptism. Let's talk about its method. Its method. We have, you can see under the screen, an opening. There's a pool right behind that. In not too many weeks, because you have given to the Transformation Project, we're going to begin several of the aspects of the Transformation Project here in the sanctuary. This screen is not going to be there on Sunday morning. We're going to have two screens on either side, and this baptistry is going to be open, and you're going to be able to see the baptistry in line with the communion table and the lectern with the Word of God, the table of Christ, and the baptistry, all three lined up in the center for us to see openly throughout the service. But reason we have that pool up there, why do we immerse professing believers? Why is that our practice? Well, first of all, there are the circumstantial evidences in Scripture. John the Baptist, as we just mentioned, for example, the Bible says in John, the book of John, chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says that John, meaning John the Baptist, was baptizing in a non near Salim on the Jordan River, of course, because there was much water there. Because there was much water there. So you need a lot of water to immerse. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, we have the story of Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch as Philip speak with him there. And we find the words in the book of Acts where Philip was with the eunuch and he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. They went down into the water. So again, those circumstantial references to much water being needed of going down into the water, it infers clearly that something other than a small amount of water was applied in baptism. Furthermore, there is what is, I believe, the most, the most convincing truth in Scripture regarding the method of baptism lies in the language itself, the word baptizo in the Greek. Now, we've talked about this before many times, but just as a refresher, understand there's a difference between a translation of a word and a transliteration. A translation is when there is a meaning equivalent to a word. A transliteration is a phonetic equivalent, a phonetic equivalent, the sound equivalent. You take a word from one language and you use letters in another language just to repeat the sound of that word. When you read in your Bible the word baptize, it is not a translation. It is a transliteration. There are a lot of words in your English Bible that are transliterations and not translations. The word apostle, that's a transliteration. It's not a translation. Apostle translated means one who is sent, sent out a uh, uh, on, a, on a mission, so to speak. Angel is a transliteration. It's not a translation. The word angel is from angelos. It means messenger. If you translate it, it would say messenger. There are many words in your English Bible that are sound equivalents of the original Greek, but they're not meaning equivalents. However, if you check any lexical reference, you will find that the Koine ancient Greek word baptizo, if it were translated, is universally rendered dip, immerse, or plunge. In fact, it was used in that ancient language to describe what was done with cloth when it was dyed. 
when cloth was dyed, it, they, they baptized it in order to dye it. And we know that dyeing cloth would Im- involve saturation. Furthermore, in terms of linguistic significance, I believe that Hebrews 9.13 gives us a, a, a strong indicator of the significance of the meaning of the word baptizo by what it doesn't mean. By what it doesn't mean. For example, I've had colleagues, ministerial colleagues, friends of mine, who have said that baptizo can mean something other than immerse or plunge. It can mean uh, pour or sprinkle. Well, if you read in Hebrews chapter 9, you find this in verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies her for the purifying of the flesh. Notice the word that's used in that verse, in that sentence. Sprinkle. Why is that word there? Because there is a Greek word that means sprinkle. It's the word rontizo. That word is translated. It's not transliterated. The meaning equivalent of the original And just as sprinkle is a different word in English than immerse, so sprinkle in Greek is a different word in Greek than immerse. Baptizo means immerse. Rontizo means sprinkle. So the reason we immerse is because biblically, both circumstantially and linguistically, then it's clearest that Immersion is the biblical practice and method of baptism. So how do we administer? The method of baptism is immersion, and that's the motive for our method. Now, a second question that is important to answer is, what is the, the, what is the meaning of baptism? I mean, what does baptism teach, or what is its purpose in terms of its relationship to the believer. What is its meaning? Well, there are many, many scriptures we could look at that would communicate this truth. But the one that I think simplifies it the best is found in Romans chapter 6. As Paul the Apostle is talking about the great plan of God's saving plan for people, and in chapter 6 of Romans... He talks about how we have been transformed into a new person and that we should not walk enslaved to sin anymore. And he begins in that section in verse 1 with a rhetorical question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's anticipating, based on what he said prior to this, He's anticipating that they may get confused and assume that sinning is okay for a believer. In fact, it might put you in a position to receive more grace. He's wanting to preclude that confusion by saying, should we then sin that grace may abound? And he says, absolutely not. No way. And then he goes on to say, How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? And then he explains that statement primarily and begins to explain it through the significance of the meaning of their baptism. He says, How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Do you see the picture there? He's saying that baptism is a picture of our own death and resurrection as we unite with Christ. You see, the meaning of baptism It is a physical enactment of a spiritual reality that takes place by God's Spirit supernaturally in the life of a person 
who trust Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, we are united with Christ. Christ becomes our life. We in Him and Him in us. We become one. <coughs> and baptism is a picture of the old life, dead and gone, and a new life with Christ. It's a picture of our resurrection with Him. Thus, the title of the sermon today, Water Grave. Water Grave. I believe the best phrase to describe the significance of baptism as God gives it to us. Water Grave. And then, a third question that we need to answer with regard to baptism is why? We talked about how do we administer it, what's the method, what's its meaning, but what's its motive? What, what, why should we be baptized? And let me, let me really zero in on this one. Let me, let me hit this hard. I, I, now, I'm, ju I'm just going to... I'm just going to unwrap my, some of my personal concerns here, all right? You're going to hear the thoughts and feel the heartbeat of H. Bradford Stevenson this morning with regard to this. In other words, I'm going to talk to you about one of my pet peeves in the church community. Is I feel like that too many times we do theology, or we make decisions about spiritual matters, or decisions about what we do as Christians in a reaction of what we feel somebody else might do that's in error. And we overreact and miss the principle biblically. Now, what am I saying by that? You say, well, I'm, I'm confused what you're saying. You know, there are a lot of circumstances where people and and the emphasis in ministry practice is that baptism becomes sort of automatic righteousness. That, that, you know, you just baptize and automatically you become right before God because of what you did. Well, that's not biblical. Listen, in, any of the, in the Lord's Supper or in baptism, there are three components. There's, there's uh, regularity, there's effectiveness, and there's validity. Water makes it regular. You, it, that's biblical. There's no record of anybody being baptized in the Bible with anything but water. So you can't baptize somebody with Coca-Cola. Okay, water makes it regular. God makes it valid. We don't validate baptism. God does. And third, faith makes it effective. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We are saved by grace through faith. If we are baptized without any trust of Jesus Christ, then it's not effective. It's not baptism that automatically saves somebody. It is baptism that is an expression of genuine trust in Christ. Now, here's what I'm saying. In the evangelical community in America, though, what has happened in an overreaction to folks who might assume that just being baptized or just taking communion automatically makes you right with God, no matter what your life looks like, whether you have faith or not, in an overreaction to that, what we do is throw out the baby with the bathwater, proverbially speaking, in the sense that we just say, well, baptism's optional. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not optional. Ba <laughs> Baptism is significant, and the motive is significant. Why? First of all, we read in Luke 3, Jesus was baptized. Jesus, was, if there was nothing else in the Bible except that, that would be enough. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you and me. <laughs> I've known people who claim to be believers and who claim to be followers of Christ and have claimed to be followers in Christ for many times, a decade or more, and have never followed Christ in baptism. I'm going to be merciful and assume there's an ignorance there. Because there is nothing biblical about that. Nothing biblical. 
If you turn to Christ in faith, biblically, your first step of public obedience should be water baptism. Biblically, read the book of Acts. Now, having said that, not only do some people completely neglect baptism and treat it as optional, we need to understand that Jesus was baptized. It's good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for us. Number two, Jesus' baptism was something that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, the one God working in harmony with himself, put his stamp of approval on. In Jesus' baptism, we see the heaven open. We see the Spirit of God descending visibly in the form of a dove. And we hear the voice of God the Father, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. If that's something that God is pleased with, it better please us if we're right with Him. If we're right with Him. And so, not only does God the Son present himself for baptism, that makes it good enough for us, God the Father confirms his blessing upon that. Furthermore, furthermore, Jesus did that, we find in Matthew's account of Jesus' baptism, in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, John the Baptist appropriately says, wouldn't we say the same thing? Baptism was for repentant sinners. Jesus was not a sinner. And John the Baptist understood that, and he said, hey, we got this backwards. <laughs> I need to let you baptize me. I don't need to be baptizing you. You're the righteous one. Jesus says, let it happen, because it's necessary to fulfill righteousness. You see, what Jesus was doing there was humbling himself and essentially the same thing that he did on the cross, he is identifying with us in our sin. So if Jesus is willing to condescend and to humble himself to be baptized, how much more should we who need it <laughs> humble ourselves to follow him? And then, if that weren't enough, understand that Jesus made sure that his followers understood when he left the earth, before he left, after the resurrection, he said, now you go, you make disciples, and baptize them. So he commanded that those who follow him be baptized. Furthermore, we see graphic evidence from the book of Acts that the disciples understood that and took it seriously because what happened on the day of Pentecost? All filled with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus, and 3,000 of them were baptized right there in Jerusalem that day on the day of Pentecost. So the disciples understood what Jesus' priority was for those who would follow him. So we should be baptized, one, because Jesus was baptized, two, because he commanded us to be baptized, and three, because we see graphic evidence in the New Testament that the apostles understood that and all the followers of Jesus were baptized as they presented themselves to him and trusted him. Now, in a negative way, we look at Luke 7, 29 and 30. You see, what's our motive? Why should we be baptized? Well, it's interesting in Luke chapter 7 that speaking of John the Baptist and his baptism... It says, when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So the Bible says that those who refused were rejecting the will of God. So... Why should we be baptized? We should be like the Ethiopian eunuch. When we truly come to Jesus, I'm excited to have a new life. Jesus has commanded me to do this. I can celebrate the new life. I want to let everybody know that I'm not ashamed of Jesus, and he's changed my life. 
and I want to meet him in the water of baptism. I want to celebrate Jesus. And baptism is a celebration of a new birth. It's a celebration of a new birth. Some of the most powerful services and, and, and times of worship that I've been a part of were connected with baptism. I was a, a, attending a baptismal service at a church once where one of, the, one of the things that I thought was a great idea that the church did is that when someone had come to Christ and they were baptized, then what they did is they had someone who was the person that was instrumental in bringing them to Christ, a friend, a relative, they became their encourager. And before the person was baptized, this person would stand outside the baptistry and read a special scripture they had selected just for them to encourage them in their walk with Christ. And I tell you, you talk about a, a, a misty-eyed moment is that one of the young men in his 20s that was baptized that night, his grandfather was in Hawaii and couldn't be there. But through the Internet, they did a live connection and over the internet, through the speaker system in the church, they had the grandfather telling his grandson how proud he was of him and reading a scripture. You talk about a powerful moment. What a celebration of new life in Christ. I tell you, there are many days that I have prayed, and I have prayed in a dry baptistry. As my heart aches for people to come to Christ, I just go in the sanctuary and I stand in a dry baptistry and I say, Lord, get it wet. Fill it up with people seeking you. You know what? Jesus treated his baptism as a moment of high and holy worship. Notice the scripture we have on the sign, while he was praying, heaven opened. That comes from this verse in Luke 3. Jesus prayed while he was being baptized, he recognized the presence of the Father and worshiped him. It was a high and holy moment, as it is for us as well. You see, what is the motive for baptism? I want to submit to you that m baptism is an expression of genuine faith that follows Jesus. Genuine faith that follows Jesus. Let me ask you, have you... Are you, are you a professing believer in Jesus and have never been baptized? I want you this morning to get that right with God. You say, what do you want me to do? <clears throat> what we do here in our congregation, if someone makes a decision for Christ and they want to follow him in baptism, we have a packet of information that explains more about baptism. There's a CD of a message like I've shared this morning about baptism there's a little study guide that I use to make an appointment with you to follow up, to go over, to make sure you understand the basics of what it means to follow Christ and to trust Him for eternal life, and we schedule your baptism. And if you are that person this morning, as the, car, as the, as the service is over, you stop by the Welcome Center. They have those packets available for you. But the first step in baptism is establishing a relationship with Jesus. So if you've never done that, Take that step this morning, and we'll make sure you get a baptismal packet. Because you see, baptism is an expression of an existing relationship with Christ and the new life that he gives us. So I pray that you would meet him today as well. You know, all that we've said about baptism is, I think, best expressed in that song that I love. I won't sing it for you. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to sing it, but I better not. I'm wanting to sing it, but it's the song of the Imperials. How many of you remember the old gospel group, the Imperials? This goes back to the early 70s. I'm dating myself, I know. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's great. It's got a real hard uh, guitar uh, uh, background, and, and, the, and, it, and it's, it's a great song. And the name of the song is, guess what? Water Grave. And it's about baptism. And here are the lyrics of that song. Listen to this. In my house, there's been a mercy killing. The man I used to be has been crucified. And the death of this man was the final way of revealing 
in a spiritual way to live, I had to die. Now, if I let that dead man linger in me, I might get a little idle in my ways. So I'm going down to the Celebration River. I'm going to take this dead man down to a water grave. I'm going down to the river. I'm going to be buried alive. I'm going to show my heavenly father, the man I used to be, has died. And then they conclude with this little chorus, when I think of where I'm going, in terms of where I've been, it makes me glad to know my Lord that I've been born again. Father, I pray that the joy of that song and those lyrics are real for everyone here today. I pray that if there be anyone here, Lord, who is a professing follower of Jesus, but yet has not followed him in the, in the water of baptism, Father, that they would repent of that this morning and that they would prepare themselves to meet you in the water of baptism. Lord, I pray that if there be someone here who has never met you, then has never even thought of following you in the water of baptism, that they would know today that they can have a brand new life that baptism signifies and gives us a picture of, of a, a new life that gives them a future and a hope. It's a certainty forever that they can live knowing that the best is yet to come because of Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of baptism. May we celebrate Jesus today.